All right, everyone. So uh, we're going to start uh, chapter eight today. So I'm going to talk about um, momentum, which is a new concept that we are covering in this in learning in this chapter, which is a kind of continuation, you can see, right? Continuation to the uh, concept of energy and uh, Newtonian dynamics. So in a way, this, uh, this momentum uh, incorporates some of the concepts from the, you know, previous, you know, seven chapters pretty much. Um, all right, so again, so we're gonna talk about what momentum is, definition of momentum, how to use momentum. Uh, and we're gonna talk about very important, you know, uh, this, this conservation of momentum, you know, uh, let's say a concept, uh, very similar to the conservation of energy, there's also conservation of momentum. So this term, you know, this, this, this quantity that we call momentum uh, can be conserved under the right condition, just like the energy can be. All right, so one thing we will see is that uh, the concept of momentum becomes very useful, especially when we're considering collisions. Because during the collisions, you know, uh, objects, you know, can be thought of as, you know, conserving their momentum. If you consider collision, you know, um, not necessarily collision itself, but, you know, the momentum of the system before collision and the momentum of the system after the collision. Because one of the things we're gonna see here is that during the collision, something, you know, the forces between them allow us to, you know, um, conserve energy uh, and conserve, uh, let's say the collision, the momentum of the collision, right? Uh, under the right circumstances. So we're gonna, you know, cover that in greater detail later in the chapter. So there, um, another very important concept we're gonna uh, learn, which is related to the momentum and that's impulse, okay? So sometimes impulse, sometimes impulsive force, but you know, it's an impulse and it's related to momentum. So that's why, you know, they really go in the same chapter. Um, then what we're gonna start doing here is uh, start learning about uh, not necessarily just a particle, but collection of particles in our system. And then we can even talk about system that uh, maybe like, let's say a rigid object, like instead of like a simple particle, it could be some kind of object that has size. So starting from this end of this chapter eight, we will start considering object that have size, which we never did before. It was just a particle, right? You know, with mass, but never, you know, we cared about size. In this chapter, we're gonna start talking about that. So that's why, one of the things we can consider and you know cover in this you know end of this chapter is center of mass. So if you have a let's say a disk, you know what is the center of mass of that disk and such those things. All right. So anyway, so let's talk about in terms of what's a momentum. All right. So uh, momentum generally is directly related to the some of the things we already you know co covered, uh, which is you know let's say object changing its motion, okay. So here's what we have. For example, uh, imagine you have a hockey pack and this is basically a hockey pack at, uh, with some initial velocity moving, let's say, to the right. So you can see, right, so you're given the object and then let's say here's the mass of the object, right? And you're given the velocity, the direction, right? So let's say by the length of the arrow, you can kind of like assume that that's, let's say, its magnitude, right? And then you have basically magnitude and direction. Now, one of the things you can, you know, uh, already, uh, let's say, visualize is that, for example, if you want to change the object's motion, that means make it go faster or make it go slower or make it change direction, for that, we need to apply some kind of force, right? So how do we change the object's motion? Well, we apply force. And that's what we have in the second picture over here. Okay, so you can see, right? You have, you know, you can think like this is before you apply force and then you apply force. So that means this is during. And remember, when you apply force, what happens here? The hockey stick and hockey pack collide, right? So that means if I'm, for example, still considering the pack as my object, then hockey stick exerts force but in order for it to exert force, right, there's this physical contact, there's a kind of like what we can call collision, right, between them, so it's, you know, it hits the pack with this force F average, okay? 
And there's a reason we call it F average because this force is technically not constant. So it increases, decreases, right? Until the pack basically leaves the stick. But you can imagine that, so this is then you can say this is during, you know, during, or maybe you can think of like, for now we can say, this is during when uh, you apply force. So during that process. And because of that applied force, what happens here, object motion is changed. For this particular case, it is moving faster. And you can see that by the length of the arrow for the final velocity. That means this is then after, okay? That's why what we have here, we have sort of like three parts of the uh, problem that we're considering. Before, you know, uh, you apply force, during, you know, that, during that time when you apply force and after. Because one of the things we're gonna talk about here is when we apply force, so let's say this second you know, part, right? During that, you know, when you apply force, there is a time interval that we, we can consider. That means the force acting on the pack is not instantaneous, right? That means, you know, um, it maybe takes a second or half a second, right? During that collision, right? When you, you know, strike the stick, you know, there's the stick in the pack, right? I mean, there is a little bit of time that those stick and a pack are in contact. So it's not like, you know, it's right away, right? Instantaneous. There's maybe like a half a second or one second time interval where they're in contact and then the stick pushes the pack, right? And that's one of the things we're also gonna be considering. That means before and after and what happens during that, you know, um, let's say you can call it like collision. So that's kind of one of the things we're gonna consider. All right, that means um, those things are related to one another. And one thing we talked about before, one thing we talked about before basically is this. So I can use kinematics and dynamics for this because what I have here is this, I have object with initial velocity, right? So with initial velocity. Uh, and then after that, you have object moving with some final velocity. That means, so technically there's a change in velocity, right? change in velocity. Now remember, if there's a change in velocity, that means, you know, as a function of time, that's because there was an acceleration, right, in the system. There has to be an acceleration in order for you to change your velocity. All right, so then where does that acceleration come from? Well, that from this force, okay? That means then we can say, all right, so according to Newton dynamics, then what I have here is maybe some kind of net force acting on the object of mass M, and that makes the object to accelerate, which, you know, allowed the object to change its speed. Okay, now this is what we, you know, used for the Newton's second law. We said this equation is the Newton's second law. But to be honest, this is not the equation that Isaac Newton wrote as his second law. One of the things we can consider here is this. So. I'm gonna rewrite this equation in terms of what Isaac Newton, you know, uh, let's say understood to be a second law. Here's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna say, okay, so this is equals to mass then times acceleration. But I'm gonna use the top equation for the acceleration because here you can see, right, I define acceleration as changing velocity over time. That means equally I can come back in here, right? This is delta V delta T, right? Because mass times acceleration uh, well, acceleration is delta V delta T. So I can replace acceleration with delta T, delta V delta T. Then what I can do here is mass, I can put it inside over there because mass is just a scalar quantity. So this becomes this change in this quantity, well, sorry, change in this quantity MV because I moved that, you know, V over there, uh, mass in, inside, right? So it becomes change in this quantity MV divided by delta t, okay. Which technically then means is, uh, you know, nothing but mv final minus mv initial, right? That's what changing, you know, means, right? Change in velocity or change in mv means mv final minus mv initial. And that's divided by this time interval delta t, okay. That means what I have here is you know, I rearranged the, the Newton's second law, which 
I, you know, which means here I eliminated acceleration altogether. So I'm writing, you can see, right? I'm writing the second line in terms of this guy's here, that means the, the mass and velocity and time interval. And that's what he did. He wrote this in terms of those quantities, okay? He wrote this in terms of those quantities because one of the things we have here is that this product over here, that product, m times v, right? So this product, let me write it here, this m times v, he defined this to be p, which is the momentum of the object. So lowercase p is the momentum. Momentum of the object. And it has units of kilogram times meter per second. And it's a vector in the same direction as velocity. Okay. That means kind of, you know, let's look at over here. Alright, so let me okay. So a delta M V delta T, which can be written as delta P delta T, which means changing objects momentum as a function of time. Okay. That means one of the things we can write here is this. So again, we define momentum to be a product of the object mass and velocity. Okay, so product of the mass and velocity. That means momentum gives you more information than just velocity itself. It also tells you the object's mass, okay? Because this is, you know, much more useful information than let's say you're considering um, just the velocity of the object. Because here's, here's what we have. So let's say, let's say I'm standing in, you know, on the street and then there are two objects moving toward me I'm going to just represent like this, right? So two objects moving toward me uh, with the same velocity. Let's say velocity or the speed of five meter per second. Two objects moving toward me, you know, at that speed. And let's say they're going to collide with me. The question here is, uh, which one should I avoid? Let's, let's say you can avoid one, but cannot avoid the other one. That means you have, you know, sort of like a, chance to avoid one, but not the other one. And you have a, uh, let's say, choice to uh, avoid whichever you want, let's say. You can, you can choose which one to avoid, but you can only avoid one of them, okay? Well, if you look at the velocity, five meter per second, or, you know, uh, moving toward you, that doesn't really give you much information, okay? Now, when you then include the momentum, if you actually consider momentum rather velocity, which includes the mass, then you can make decisions. So for example, then maybe this, you know, here's object one, here's object two. Okay. See, let's say object one is a mosquito, which have a mass of, I don't know, maybe like, let's say uh, 10 to the negative five kilogram or something like that. Okay. And that the other one is maybe an elephant, right? Which has a mass of maybe 10 to the, I don't know, three kilograms, right? Okay. And now you can decide, right? Do you want to, you know, collide with mosquito moving at five meter per second or with an elephant, which has a thousand kilogram, you know, and moving at five meter per second. So you can see, right, this is, you know, the mosquito, which is, you know, like let's say 10 to the negative five kilogram compared to um, an elephant. So that means we can calculate the momentum and get, let's say 10 to the negative five times five meter per second and what we get here is five times 10 to the negative five, the units for kilogram meter per second, right? Or here, momentum two, which will be 10 to the three kilograms times five meter per second. And you get five times 10 to the three, which is 5,000 kilogram meter per second. That means you can see, right? You are, you know, factor of, you know, or is it uh, negative five? So factor of eight, 
you know, uh, difference. And when you consider then collision, you definitely want to collide with the mosquito because it has very small momentum compared to elephant, which has a large momentum. Okay, so that's why momentum becomes more useful when we're considering those type of, you know, circumstances, their collisions and things like that. All right. Anyway, so that means one thing we can, you know, consider right now is that object's momentum, okay, is product of mass and velocity, okay? That means when you consider an object, okay, like give you a different example here. So when you consider, for example, an object that has the same mass, right? Uh, but, but the one that's moving faster, will have a greater two objects with same mass, but one moving faster, right? Uh, then whichever moving faster will have a bigger momentum, okay? That means here's momentum, which is mass times velocity. That means let's say here's an object moving with this small velocity and here's the mass. Then what we have here is velocity is a vector, okay? So it has a magnitude and direction. Mass is a scalar. So when you're calculating the momentum, the mass just, you know, changes the, mag you know, the magnitude of the momentum, but velocity also gives it a direction. That means the momentum always in the same direction as the object's velocity. That means at that instant, right? If for example, this is five kilogram object moving at two, two meter per second speed. And you can see, right, I can write this as, a, let's say X hat to be in a horizontal direction. Then the momentum will be five kilograms times two meter per second X hat, right? You can see that then the momentum here is 10 kilograms meter per second X hat. That means it takes the direction of the velocity. That means I can present another vector over here in the same direction and say, okay, so this is the momentum. Just like we have it over here, right? Whichever the direction velocity of the object is, same direction, the momentum at that instant. Because you can, you can understand, right? So if a few seconds later, the object moving faster, right? At the greater, higher speed, then momentum is also increases, okay? That means in this case, we can assume that momentum can change of the object, right? If the velocity changes. We're gonna, we're gonna consider the mass unless you, you know, we directly tell you that you can break the object into two or three parts, right? Uh, we're gonna assume that if you have an object moving uh, with some velocity and it has some mass M, like, you know, like for example, in this picture over here, right? We can assume that mass doesn't change. That means the only way we can change the momentum of, the, of that object, right? Is if we change its velocity. Okay, so that's why this equation kind of represent that. That means, for example, right? So I have here this object that I, you know, let's say for this one that I calculated. So this object moving to the right with two meter per second, and it has a momentum of 10 kilogram meter per second. Okay, and how do I change the momentum? Well, assuming that I don't change the mass, I can make it go faster or I can make it go slower. That means I can increase velocity or decrease velocity. And if I increase velocity or decrease velocity, that means I'm changing momentum, okay? And if I'm changing momentum, as you can see, right? That very first picture that we have, right? So you can see that. So if I'm changing momentum, that means I have to, in order for me to change momentum, I have to apply force. That means right now I'm considering momentum before and in order for the momentum after to be higher or greater value, right? I need to apply force. Okay, so that's kind of what we, you know, considering. That means here's this equation, right? So this is final momentum of the object. This is initial momentum of the object, right? MV final is final momentum. MV initial is initial momentum. That means what I have here is there's a change in momentum. And remember it now from this equation, see if I take Delta T and I move it to the other side, that means multiply both sides by Delta T. Then what I get here is this equation over here. That means in order for me to change the momentum of the object, what I need to do here is apply force during this short time interval. Remember as I said, right? When you apply force, that force is not instantaneous. That force, you know, takes few seconds or milliseconds or microseconds, whatever, but certain amount of time. 
And we have to then consider that. That means in order to change the momentum, you need an applied force, you know, that acting on the object during some short time interval. All right, so the momentum can obviously be also two dimensional because if object moving in two dimensional, let's say it has a two dimensional velocity, that means, you know, so for example, see this, this is a velocity vector of the object. Well, that means I can take the velocity two to be horizontal and vertical. Okay, oh, not final, sorry. So I can take the velocity to also be horizontal and vertical. Then I take mass times horizontal velocity to get horizontal momentum and mass times vertical velocity to get vertical momentum, okay? That means, for example, let's say this velocity was uh, five meter per second, but this time acting at, you know, let's say 25 degree above the horizontal. You remember the X component will be V cosine theta, then Y component will be uh, V sine of theta. So then I can plug in the values, calculate the X and Y components, and use that to find the X and Y component of the momentum, okay? And then from that, once I calculate PX and PY, that means X and Y component of the momentum, I can find the magnitude of the momentum by using the Pythagorean theorem. And I can find the direction of the momentum too, which will be inverse tangent of Y component over the X component. Okay, so I can then use those equations to calculate those things. All right, so let's look at an example to kind of summarize everything that we just learned. So uh, for example, you are given a mass, a ball of mass M equals 0.25 kilogram, uh, rolling to the right at 1.3 meter per second. Okay, so let's say here's our object uh, with the 0.25 mass, you know, rolling to the right with 1.3 meter per second. That means we write the mass, we write the initial velocity, and then you can do put the visual, right? So let's say this is the picture of that. As you can see, right? I write that as before. That's before, right? You know, it collides with, you can see, right? It's gonna collide with the wall, okay? Anyway, so it's a 0.25 kilogram rolling to the right at 1.3 meter per second, strikes a wall and rebounds to the left at 1.1 meter per second. What is the change in ball's momentum? Okay, and what I have here is I'm gonna for now, just ignore this last part. It says, what is the impulse delivered? So I'm, you know, it's something we're gonna consider at the end of the chapter where I, you know, I actually talk about the, you know, uh, the impulse here. What I'm gonna do here is just look at in terms of the change in balls momentum. Okay. Now what I have here is, is this. So that means you write down mass as 0.25 kilograms. You write down initial velocity as 1.3 meter per second. Now, one thing I recommend here is you use that unit vector. Remember, right now it's in a X hat direction, right? Basically pointing to the right. And then we also given the final velocity, which is 1.1 meter per second. But remember, it says that the the ball strikes the you know wall and then rebounds with that velocity. That means this is basically going to be in a negative X hat direction. That means we can write this as negative 1.1 meter per second x hat. Okay, so that's why it's, it's important to write them the direction, right? Because if it's to the left, that means it has to be negative. All right, so now what we do here is we write down then uh, the momentum, right? So for example, you can write as, all right, so here's the initial momentum, which is mass times initial velocity, okay? So that's 0 0.25 kilograms, then times 1.3, meter per second x hat, okay? So if I do that calculation, right? So what I will get here is 0.325 kilogram meter per second x hat, because it's a, you know, it's a momentum, right? It has a magnitude and direction, okay? Now here's then the final, mass times final velocity. And this is then, um, 0.25 kilograms times negative 1.1 meter per second x hat. And if I do this, I'm gonna get negative 0 0.275 kilograms times meter per second x hat. 
right? So you can see, right, calculate magnitude and the direction of the momentum because the velocity initial is to the right, so it's positive. Initial momentum is positive. Final velocity is to the left, it's negative. That means final momentum is negative. And then I calculate change in momentum, which is delta P, which means it's P final minus P initial. Well, P final here is negative 0 0.275 kilogram meter per second, right? Um, let's say x hat. And this is then minus initial, which is 0 0.325 kilogram meter per second x hat. Because both in the same axis, right? So, and you know, minus the value, right? So I end up, you know, just basically adding those negative values together to get negative 0 0.60 kilogram meter per second. That means what we get here is the change in momentum that is 0 0.60 kilogram per second and it's negative, it means negative 0.6 kilogram meter per second. Now, here's what you can think of like, let's say if your momentum overall is negative, that means you are pretty much moving to the left. That's kind of what you can kind of like consider this. That's why, right? Because, you know, this was negative, right? And you subtract, um, oh, it means that, you know, overall momentum was, sort of like change in momentum was like negative. Also one, one thing you will, you know, uh, learn later on here is uh, generally the change in momentum uh, or the sign of change in momentum is consistent with the direction of the force that is applied. So you can see, right? change in momentum here is negative. And then we can come back and see that what happens during the collision, well, there was a force acting on it and that force changed the momentum, right? Of the object, we can see before, during and after. And look at the direction of the force. It's negative, right? Because it's to the left. And look at the direction of the change in momentum. It's also negative. So that generally that's kind of, you know, consistent with that. All right. Um, Okay, so here's then another thing we can consider. That was just one object in our system moving with some velocity, but you can have one, two, three objects. So think like this, this is some kind of, you know, before something happens. Okay, and I have three objects moving at uh, some, you know, velocity one, two, and three. Remember, this is basically M1, this is V1, this is M2, this is V2, and this is M3, this is V3. Each one moving with some, you know, velocity. That means what I can do here, I can say, all right, so there is mass one, velocity one. That's my object one, and it's, you know, product of mass and velocity, plus mass two, velocity two, and this is my second one, then plus M3, velocity three, and this is my third one. That means this is momentum one, this is momentum two, this is momentum three. And what I have here is, if, since my system has all three of those particles in the system, I can add those together to find total momentum, okay? And you can see, right, it's, well, let's say plus dot, 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 some, you know, I, you know, particle, doesn't matter, you know, how many you have. You can have 10 in your system, you can have 100 in your system. All you do is find, you know, their momentum and then add them together for that instance. So let's say if this is before something happens to the system, then you want to know what is the total momentum of my system before something happened. And you can, you know, calculate that. All right, so here's, for example, um, this is, you have two astronauts, right? Um, you can see, right, it's provide excellent example of momentum transfer. Um, because one of the things we can have here is, um, we, let's say for example, we assume that they are initially at the rest and then they push on each other. And remember when they push on each other, according to Newton's third law, they exert force on one another, FB on A and FA on B. Okay. That means what I have here is that object A, which is astronaut A, you know, if I calculate its momentum before so let's say this is before. So the momentum of A before, and sometimes we just basically put the initial, 
So initial momentum of, of, of object A will be mass of A times velocity of A initial. Okay. Remember, one thing we can say here, initially they were at rest. So this guy was zero. That means the entire thing is zero. Same thing, for example, for the, you know, object B. So the mass of B, then times velocity of B. Okay. Again, we assume that, let me put it here, initial. Let's assume that initially both of them were at rest. That means there was also no momentum for the object B. Now then what is the total momentum of the system before they push on each other? Well, this is total momentum I, which is before. And you can see, right? It's zero because momentum of, well, let me, let me kind of do this. This would be momentum of A before plus momentum of B before. And you can see, right, you're gonna get zero because they have no momentum to start with. Okay. Now, one of the things we have here is they then, then they push each other. Okay. So they for, exert force on one another. And obviously one thing we learned here is that if you apply force on particle A or object A, which is due to the object B, right? Then the momentum of A final will be different, right? It will not be the same as momentum of A before because it's gonna be, you know, moving now after you apply force. Same thing is here. Momentum of B final, which is after the, you know, they push on each other, will not be the same as momentum of, uh, you know, B initial before, you know, they push on each other. So those quantities are not the same anymore. But one thing we're gonna see, and I'm gonna kind of go over the whole concept before we do some calculation. If I calculate the momentum total after they push each other, that means the final momentum, what I will get here is same as before, which is zero, okay? Remember, that means this will be what? This will be final momentum of A plus final momentum of B. If I you know, add those both of them after the collision, right? What I will get here is zero, okay? Now, we're gonna, kind of talk about why it's zero and you know, what are the right conditions of that zero. But you know, what we'll have here is momentum would be conserved for the right, you know, conditions. And we wanna go kind of go over that, what makes the conditions are right and what makes condition wrong for the momentum to be conserved. But you know, conservation of momentum is very, very important, you know, uh, let's say concept in physics and we're gonna be able to use that to solve, you know, very, you know, let's say complicated problems by simply using this concept of, you know, conservational momentum and, you know, solve those problems in just two, three steps, okay? All right, so let's kind of then start, you know, considering uh, this derivation of this conservational momentum, okay? And we're gonna do that by looking at two objects, okay? Initially, uh, moving with some velocity. Okay, and we're gonna have them moving toward each other. Okay, that means this is gonna be my system. Again, what I have here, you know, be careful here, right? So what I have here is my system now includes two objects, object one and object two, okay? So this guy has M1, this guy has M2. And it's moving with some velocity one, in one initial, and this is velocity of two initial. Okay, that means those are two objects in my system and this is before, you know, let's say they collide. Now, what I have here is then um, two objects moving toward each other and both have velocity. So what, what can I do here is I can find the momentum of my system before, right? So I can say this is my initial momentum, okay? So initial total momentum, so without one or two subgroups, this is gonna be PI means initial total momentum. What is the initial total momentum equals to? Well, it's equals to the sum of the object one initial momentum and object two initial momentum, P1 initial plus P2 initial. All right, that means, you know, I find the momentum of one plus momentum of two, add them together, that's my initial total. 
before collision. Obviously, you can see that as they are moving toward each other, they're gonna collide. Well, when they collide, and this kind of represent that, so when they collide, so this is collision, right, between two objects, uh, and during the collision, according to Newton's third law, again, they exert force on one another, and remember this force here is action-reaction force, okay? That means what I have here is that this is enduring collision, right? That means there's a net force, which is, you know, force that two exerts on one, plus force that one exerts on two. Because this is both of them in my system, right? I can say that my system has two forces, you know, one acting on object one from two, the other one is acting on object two from one, okay? That means this is my net force during the collision. And the end result here is, then after the collision, right, you can see, right, object move, object one moving to the left, object two moving to the right, and like in opposite direction what they had initially. And then here I can calculate this momentum final of the system. This will be momentum of one final plus momentum of two final, okay? That means momentum of one and two before and after, okay? Now what I have here is this, okay? That means, see, this is the system momentum after the collision. This is the system momentum before collision. And what we learned here is this, right? So I can change my object's momentum. Remember that you can rearrange Newton's second law equation. So I can, you know, change my object's momentum, you know, if I apply some kind of net force, right? That acting on the system during this short time interval. Delta T, okay. And what I have here is, you know, you can see, right, individually, object one changes momentum. It was moving to the right, now it's moving to the left. Object two, moving to the left, now moving to the right. But I'm not considering them individually. I'm considering the system, okay? And what I wanna look at here is, is my system momentum different before and after? So for example, if I, let's say I'm just shooting a number. If I calculate here and I get, let's say 50 kilogram meter per second, that's my momentum of the system before collision. I wanna know, would this also be that? Would this also be 50 kilogram meter per second or not? Well, what it depends on here is, you can see, right? In order for to look at what I have over here, it depends on, you know, you know on the right side of the equation, okay? Because if the right side of the equation is non-zero, that means my momentum will be different, right? Delta P cannot be then zero. But here's what I have. This net force is this net force over there, okay? Which means this, you know, F21, which is the force that two exerts on one, plus F12, which is the force that, you know, one exerts on two. And it's, you know, this net force is the sum of those. But here's what, I, what, we, what you should remember from the Newton's third law. That all the action reaction forces are same magnitude, opposite direction. That means technically F21 is equal to negative of F12. That means they're equal in magnitude at opposite direction. That means if I take into account their direction, so I can, I can take this F21 and I can say this, this is the same thing as negative F12. And you can see what I have over there. Negative F12 plus F12. Well, clearly they cancel each other. That means I get zero, okay? And there's a big reason for that because those forces are action reaction forces inside my system between those two colliding objects, okay? That means what I have here is the net force in these collisions happen to be zero, okay? Then conclusion is this. If then delta P is equals to net force times delta T by this here zero, means then the right side of the equation is equals to zero. That means delta P is zero. What, what, what does it mean that delta P is zero? Well, it means that if you do P final minus P initial, P final of the system minus P initial of the system, well, you get zero. That means they are not different. They are the same. That means there is 
no change in the total momentum of the system. Right? That means momentum before and after is exactly the same. So, and that is true because we consider those two objects part of my system. And it's going to be true if we then make sure that our system, you can see, right, is isolated from environment. And those two forces, F21 and F12, were the forces between my particles in the system. Because if, that is, if that's the case, then the total momentum of the system will be conserved. That means the way I know that this is conserved, this quantity, right, delta P is equals to zero. That's how I know that momentum is conserved. That means momentum before, you can see, right, so momentum before is same as momentum after. Remember, I, I, I think I, I put like, let me quickly see over here, 50. So I put 50, that means this is 50 kilogram meter per second. That means this guy here is 50 kilogram meter per second. Okay. Not necessarily because, you know, P1 initially same as P2 initial or P1 initially same as P, you know, P, P1 final. But, you know, when you algebraically add, you know, and find P initial and algebraically calculate and find P final, those values will be the same. Okay. Because internal forces and those F12 and F21, those are internal forces. They act only between particles within a system. Okay. And the total momentum of a system subjected to only internal forces is always conserved because internal forces always cancel each other. That means forces like friction, you know, push or pull and things like that, we don't consider. Those are gonna be then external forces and we assume that there are no external forces. And that's what the basic in the next slide kind of covers that the external forces, right, uh, are forces from agents outside my system. Okay, if somebody pushing or pulling and there's a friction, those are outside of my system. They can change the system's momentum before and after and I don't have a conservation of momentum. But if I have this, right, if I have P final minus P initial, which, which means I wanna know if there's a difference between them, and this is equal to the net force, right, times delta T. So what I have here is thing like this, this is external. So, because I don't need to, you know, include external forces, right? Because internal forces always cancel each other. But here's what I have. So like, you can think like, this is F net or F external. But if this is zero, that means all the internal forces always cancel but there are also no external forces. That means I can say that the right side here of the equation is zero. That means P final minus P initial equals zero, which means P final is equals to P initial and my momentum is conserved, okay? And this is true for an isolated system. An isolated system is a system with no net external force acting on it, leaving the momentum unchanged. So, it means we are down to this definition of the law of conservation of momentum, okay? And remember, we need an isolated system with, you know, uh, with multiple particles. And what we have here is this, the total momentum P of an isolated system is a constant, which means as I calculate, remember, like a 50 kilogram meter per second for initial momentum, 50 kilogram meter per second for the final momentum. That means it's constant, it doesn't change. And that's because I have an isolated system with no external forces, right? So the law of conservation of momentum for an isolated system can be written as momentum after is same as momentum before. They're equal to one another, okay? So before and after, no change in momentum. Now, one thing I have here is uh, this basic definition is the total momentum after an interaction is equal to the total momentum before interaction. Okay. So let's look at, you know, thing like this. So if I'm writing initial momentum of the system, and if I had those, those two particles in my system, well, I can write this initial momentum is nothing but the sum of the, you know, remember this is P1 initial plus P2 initial. And then this should be then equals to the P final, which is nothing but P1 final plus P2 final, okay? That means if I kind of take away those two, that means those two are equal to one another. That means P1 initial plus P2 initial equals P1 final plus P2 final, okay? 
Now I can rewrite this in terms of mass one, velocity one initial, which is momentum of the one before collision, plus mass two, velocity two initial, which is momentum of the object two before collision. So that's together is my P initial. And this will be equals to then M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final, which is sum of the momentum after the collision. And that's your P final. And then I can say P initial equals P final, but write it in this format. So then we can calculate some quantities like mass, velocity before and after and thing like that. So you can say that this equation, right? Let's call this equation one. That's the equation for the conservation of linear momentum between two you know, particles colliding in an isolated system. Okay, so obviously one thing we can have here is, let's say if you have two particles moving like this, colliding with each other on, you know, on a horizontal axis like that, right? So this is just one dimensional, okay? But you can also have something like that, right? So for example, maybe you have two particles colliding like that. See, that means if I take those into, let's say, Cartesian coordinate system, I can see that they're two dimensional. That means I can have momentum of the system in the X direction conserved. Look, let's say momentum of one initial in the X direction equals momentum of two initial in the X direction. Or momentum of the one initial in the Y direction equals momentum of two initial in the Y direction. Okay. Let me, actually, let me do this. So, okay, I can get rid of this. So, so that what I wanted to say here is this. Sorry. So, momentum of the system in x direction equals momentum of the, you know, system after the collision in X direction and momentum of the system initially in the Y direction equals momentum of the system after the collision in the Y direction. That means we have, you know, X and Y dimensions now to take care of. Because if you, if you have two dimensional collision, then you have two equations, right? So you can see, right, X component, say this is final momentum of the system, initial momentum of the system. You're only considering you know, X components of the, you know, uh, momentums. And then Y components separately, right? Momentum after in a Y direction equals momentum before, but in a Y direction, right? So I'm gonna do an example for one dimensional momentum, an example for the two dimensional momentum. You guys we should be able to see, let's say how things are. All right, so here's, you know, example. So I'm gonna uh, solve a couple of, you know, momentum problems. And, you know, you should be able to hopefully now uh, see how some of those things are related. Okay, so remember those, remember those astronaut problem, right? So we're gonna kind of come back, but instead of astronaut, we have two people kind of pushing each other on a, you know, and they're, you know, on ice, right? On a frictionless ice, they're, you know, as ice skaters, right? So very similar, you know, uh, condition, because remember, the idea here is if you have two astronauts in space, there is no friction. There's no, in, you know, no gravity, nothing like that. And the only thing between them is their force between, you know, the you know, action reaction force between them when they push on each other. Same thing here. So you have, you know, Sandra and David, right? Two ice skaters, Sandra and David, and they stand facing each other on a frictionless ice. And what you have here is um, Sandra has a mass of 45 kilogram and David has a mass of 80 kilograms. So you're given their mass and, you know, mass of Sandra and mass of David. Uh, then they push off from each other. After the push, Sandra moves off at the speed of 2.2 meter per second. And what we wanna find here is what is the David speed after you know, they push on each other. And that's what we not given, okay? That's something we're gonna be then trying to find. All right, so that means one of the things you can see here is this is before collision this is after the collision. So then what happens to the during the collision? Well, I don't need to worry about that anymore because when you're considering conservation of momentum, remember whatever force they exert on one another, they cancels. I don't, I don't have any net force. That means you don't have any more that middle part of the 
uh, problem before collision, during collision, and after the collision, because we're assuming it's an isolated system with all the forces between them are action reaction, so they cancel each other. I don't have to worry about that during collision part. That means what I have here is before and after, just like the energy, remember, before and after, right? At point one, point two, something like that. Same thing is here. All right, so then I can write here, okay, so this is before. Okay, This is then momentum before, which is momentum of um, David initial plus momentum of Sandra initial, okay? Which ends up being, let's say, mass of, mass of David times velocity of David initial plus mass of Sandra, velocity of Sandra initial, okay? And this is after, which means P final equals P initial. Um, sorry, P final of the system, which is P David final plus P Sandra final. Momentum, final momentum of David plus final momentum of Sandra. Well, this is mass of David times velocity of David after the right, the final, plus mass of Sandra times velocity of the Sandra final. And that, that means that I'm saying that P initial equals to P final, okay? That means mass of David times velocity of David initial plus mass of Sandra times velocity of the Sandra initial equals to the mass of David times velocity of the David final plus mass of Sandra times velocity of the Sandra final, okay? This is how you write conservation of linear momentum. All right, so now, um, what I have here is, that's my general equation, right? So kind of like, you know, you start with that equation. Can't do that. So let's say you start with this equation. And then what we had here is, look at the, we're given the mass of Sandra and David, and we're given the initial velocity of Sandra and David, which is zero and zero. Means that this is zero and this is zero. Means that momentum before is zero. So then what is the momentum of after? Well, it also has to be zero, right? Because the same as momentum before. That means this left side is zero and the right side here is MD, mass of David times velocity of David final plus mass of Sandra times velocity of the Sandra final. This algebraic sum of those should also be zero, all right? And what I, what I can do here is I can rearrange. I can say, okay, so then mass of David times velocity of David equals, so if I rearrange, right, this becomes negative mass of Sandra and the velocity of the Sandra final. Then divide both sides by mass of David. Then this will allow me to find equation, uh, expression for the velocity, final velocity of David. So if I do that, then I get negative. Mass of Sandra here is 45 kilograms. Velocity of the Sandra was 2.2 meter per second. Divided mass of David, which was 80 kilograms. Right. So then I can do that calculation to solve for the mass of, uh, this is final velocity of David. So final velocity of David here is then negative 1.2 meter per second. Now, why is it negative? Because you can see, right, David is moving to the left. So its velocity has to be negative. And why is it less than, uh, let's say, uh, Sandra's? Well, technically because, you know, he's heavier. Remember, the idea is that mass times velocity, that means 80 times negative 1.2, then plus mass times velocity for Sandra, which is 45 times 2.2, you know, yes, you, you should, you know, when you add those together, you should be getting zero. So that's why. So it works out in such a way that if you do 80 times negative 1.2 plus 45 times 2.2, they equal to one another, but negatives, right? Opposite, so you get zero. All right. Um, another thing sometimes you might have here is, you know, uh, an explosion which in this case you have, um, you can see, right, when the particle of a system move apart after a brief intense interaction. Uh, an explosion is the opposite of collision. So the forces are internal still, 
And if the system is isolated, the total momentum is conserved. Okay, so for example, here you have a, a rocket with some fuel in it, right? So that means they're together, rocket and a fuel, and they are at rest initially. So the momentum of the system is zero. So I can say, right, momentum initial is momentum initial of the rocket plus momentum initial of the fuel. And this is equal to zero because both at rest. And then what happens here, the rocket is actually able to, you know, push itself upward by dumping the fuel and dumping the fuel in the opposite direction. That means if he pushes the gas down, gas pushes the rocket upward. And then you can say that this is equal to the final momentum. So since what you have here is that final momentum is the final momentum of the rocket plus final momentum of the fuel, right? Then what we have here is you can see, right? Final momentum of the rocket is equals to, or, you know, let's like this final momentum of the fuel, FF, I guess, is equal to negative of the final momentum of the rocket. And you can see, right, this is down and this is up. Well, I guess not fuel, but gas. So you can put this gas. Same thing. Okay. And again, what you can he see here is the momentum is conserved before and after. Okay. All right, so now we're going to look at collision um, in, from, the, from the point of view, like let's say a uh, collision between two objects. And because there technically can be um, two types of collision that we're going to consider. Okay. So collision is going to, we're going to start with the one dimensional collision, right? And then technically this will, can also be applied to two dimensional collision. But let's start with one dimensional collision. Remember, so definition of collision is um, an event during which two particles come close to each other and interact by means of force. Okay, that means they, they, you know, they move toward each other or technically one thing we can see that, let's say if we have one object is at rest, another one is moving toward that, you know, the second one. Uh, but what we have is that the collision between two particles. Okay, and generally, they exert force on each other, which again, it was our internal forces, but they exert force on each other. And the time interval during which the velocity changes from its initial to final is assumed to be short, very short, usually microseconds, you know, milliseconds or few seconds, right? So it's a very short time interval, but still it's not zero, right? There is a little bit of time interval. The interaction forces seem to be much greater than external forces. That means the in internal forces that we're considering between two particles um, are the ones that dominate. So let's say, what if there are some external forces, but the external forces are so much smaller than the internal forces, then technically we can ignore them. Because saying that there are no external forces is not really realistic. But if the internal forces are much stronger than the external forces, we can just ignore completely altogether those external forces. And then we can say that, you know, the external forces are zero um, or negligible and it's dominated by internal forces which cancel each other so then you have a conservation of momentum okay so um and you can see right um, what we can do there's a means that impulse approximation can be used which we'll learn in a little bit also after this you know after covering the you know this this collisions and um you can see right here is an you know uh, kind of like a visual of two objects colliding you can see, right, the force between them, uh, you have M1 and M2, doesn't matter what are the sizes of those objects, right? Any two interacting objects, regardless of their size, if they're interacting, the forces they exert on one another is exactly the same. Because two objects always exert the same magnitude force on each other, okay? Then you can see, right, so collision may be a result of a physical contact, those two, you know, colliding. And it also can be like through the, you know, electric forces or gravitational forces and things like that. So technically it can be, you know, through those, uh, what we call long range forces, but we don't really consider those here. Uh, you know, let's say we can mostly concentrate on physical forces, physical contact forces. Okay. But in any case, if the system is isolated, then the momentum is conserved. Okay. And then the, uh, you can say that 
uh, conservation of momentum can allow us to find the velocity of the particles, let's say before, uh, you know, after the collision or before the collision, depending, let's say what's given and what we need to find. Okay. Now, we're gonna break collisions into two categories, okay? So let's say you have a collision where the momentum is conserved, right? But then they could be what we call elastic collisions, okay? And in elastic collisions, a momentum is conserved because it's a collision, momentum is conserved, but we can also have energy of the system or kinetic energy of the system conserved as well, okay? So that's, that means there's a momentum conservation of the system before and after, but it also energy conservation of the system before and after, okay? If those condition one and condition two are satisfied, our collision here is elastic collision. Okay, elastic collision, you can, you can say like, let's say elastic collision is defined to be a type of collision where momentum and energy is conserved, okay? So there's a, what we call perfectly elastic collision. Those are occur on microscopic level, like between particles, subatomic particles and things like that. And in a microscopic collisions, only approximately elastic collisions actually occur. So they're going to, when two cars collide to billiard ball collide, right? Those are kind of macroscopic. Macroscopic means big objects. Then we can also have an inelastic collision. So elastic and inelastic collision. And the difference here is that momentum is still conserved, but energy is not, okay? That means for here's a condition one where the momentum is still conserved, but for the condition two, you know, sorry, momentum is still conserved, but energy before and after no longer the same. So if you have this, then you have inelastic. And if you have that over there, that means you have elastic, okay? That means collision can be, you know, elastic or inelastic. And momentum is conserved in both types of collisions, regardless if it's elastic or inelastic. The difference here is that energy is not conserved, okay? So that's kind of, you know, the main difference, you know, let's say between those two collisions, okay? So if the, now, one thing we have here is this. There is one type of problem where, you know, you can right away tell that this is inelastic collision, okay? And that's when two objects collide and they stick together. You can say, right, objects stick together. So when objects stick together, then you know it's an inelastic collision, but because they have, you know, they, because they stick together and not every inelastic collisions they stick together, only some types of inelastic collisions they stick together, we call this perfectly inelastic. Let me think like this. So here's what I have. So let's say I have inelastic collision. Okay, inelastic. Okay, so you can have, basically inelastic means that, uh, thing like this. So momentum is conserved before and after, but energy is not. We usually write it in terms of kinetic energy, but you know, uh, you can think of like whenever we consider the energy of the collisions, it's always in terms of kinetic energy. So I can say that kinetic energy before and after, they are not the same. Okay. Now, one thing we have here is, so this is inelastic collision. And in inelastic collision, you can have two objects moving toward each other, and then they collide, and they move in opposite direction, let's say, for example. This is, you know, inelastic. This could be an inelastic collision. Now, how do we know it's an inelastic? Well, I calculate the moment, uh, the kinetic energy of the system before they collide. I calculate kinetic energy of the system after they collide right? That means the kinetic energy of the system before, compare that to the kinetic energy of the system after. And if they're not the same, like in this condition, right? That means it's a inelastic condition, inelastic collision. Inelastic collision means that final kinetic energy is always, let me go also give you that, final kinetic energy is always gonna be less than initial kinetic energy. Okay, that will be always true. Now, but also some cases, you know, Let's say, so you can have, this is before, right? But 
you might have, let's say, one case where they, you know, after colliding, moving apart, or let's say you might have after the collision, they stick together and let's say move as one, okay? That means what I have here is, if they stick together and move as one, then I know right away that it's inelastic collision. I don't have to even calculate their kinetic energy before and after to figure out if it's inelastic or not. It's already inelastic because they stick together. Objects never stick together for elastic collisions. Only during some of the inelastic collisions they stick together. So we call this perfectly inelastic. Okay, that means whenever they stick together, that is known as a perfectly inelastic collision. All right, now you can see right, momentum is conserved for all you know collisions being elastic or inelastic. Okay, but what I have here is a lot of times you want to also know information about how much energy was lost during the collisions and things like that. That means we know we also have to take into account that you know kinetic energy of the system. Okay. Now, let's start with the perfectly inelastic collision. And the reason we start with the perfectly inelastic collision, because that's honestly the easiest one to, you know, to work with. So here's, let's say our system consists of two particles, M1 and M2, moving toward each other with some, you know, initial velocity V1 and V2. So then I can write this, you know, M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial. Now that's my momentum of the system before they collide. Okay. Now it is equal to the momentum after they collide, but after the collision, they stick together and move as one. That means what I have here is my final momentum will be in terms of two objects that combine as one object. You see that they, they stick together. So I can consider them as just one object of mass M1 plus M2. So they basically is like a blob of object, right? So it's one object. And obviously it's gonna be moving with just one velocity because they stick together. So the final momentum will be in terms of, you know, M1 plus M2, then times V final. Okay. That means my object after the collision or my objects, right? After the collision, you know, stick together and become just one object. Okay. That means I have this equation as the, conservation of momentum for perfectly inelastic collisions. And a lot of times I might ask you to find the final velocity of the system. And then you can see, right, you can just rearrange this and say, okay, M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial. And this is divided by the, you know, M1 plus M2 is what we can then find as an expression for V final, okay? That means this will allow you to find the final velocity of the system after the collision. So you're gonna find the magnitude and direction. If it's positive, it's to the right. If it's negative, it's, you know, it's gonna be then to the left. All right, so, um, okay, so this was the equation for the perfectly inelastic collision. Yeah, so you always use this equation whenever you know that objects are, you know, um, sticking to one another, okay? Now, one of the things we're gonna see uh, for the perfectly inelastic collision, and this is again, true for any inelastic collision, including this one, right? That the system and the kinetic energy before and after will not be the same. So now, how would I calculate the kinetic energy of the system before the collision? Well, you can see, right? Object one has a kinetic energy because it is moving in the beginning and object two has a kinetic energy to start with. So I have then um, one half mass of one, speed of one square initial plus one half mass of two, then speed of two initial square. That's how I would calculate the kinetic energy of the system uh, before collision. I remember this is speed square, so you basically get some kind of positive quantity. And then here's the kinetic energy of the system after the collision. Well, they have one object, right, after the collision, because they stick together. So what I would do here, I will then calculate one half, mass one plus mass two as a combined mass, then times V final square. So once I calculate my V final, I will plug into here this equation and calculate K final. 
And one of the things you will see here is always K final will be always less than K initial because energy will be lost to heat for any type of inelastic collisions. All right, so next let's talk about, you know, perfectly elastic or just elastic collisions. Uh, one of the things we have here is for elastic collisions, while well, the momentum is conserved, but so is energy. That means we have those two conservation laws put together, All right? So here's what I have. So let's say taking those two objects, right? Um, moving toward each other uh, with some initial velocity. So I can write the conservation of, so this is momentum. P initial equals P final, okay, condition one. Well, this will be in terms of M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial and equals to M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final, right? That means this is momentum before of the system equals to the momentum of the system after. And if it's elastic, that means they will never stick to one another, right? So there's no sticking together. They're always gonna be bouncing off of each other or something like that, okay? But there you will always have two separate objects at the end. Well, we also have kinetic energy before and after is the same. That means I can write this as, you know, one half mass one, velocity of one initial square plus one half mass two, velocity of two initial square. This is equals to then one half mass one V one final square plus one half mass two V two final square. And remember this is speed. So you always put a positive quantity over there and you're squaring that, right? That means none of those quantities are technically negative. Okay, so you just end up adding them together. And one thing you will see here is that this guy here, which is kinetic energy before, is equal to this one, which is kinetic energy after. They're always gonna be equal to one another, okay? Now, one thing we'll always ask for this type of problems, right? Let's say is, all right, so then what is the final velocity of object one or object two? And it's relatively complicated to derive those equations if you're deriving using this, because what you have is they have two equations and then you have to combine those two equations, eliminate some of those quantities and then have, you know, final velocity of one and two equations expressions. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna give you those expressions, right? So that means what we have here is this, for elastic collision in one dimension, particle two initially at rest. And one of the things that we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take even a simpler condition where this object two initially at rest, that means V two initially is zero, okay? So I'm gonna give you equations for this condition, all right? So I have basically the collision between two objects where you can say, right, the object two initially at rest, okay? If that's the case, then I can find the expression. Again, derivation is very tedious, so I'm gonna give you the expression. So let's say V1 final, that means what is the final velocity of object one after collision? You can calculate by M1 minus M2, the difference of the mass one and two, divided by sum of mass one and two, and then this quantity times initial velocity of the object one. Because remember, we are assuming that object two has no initial velocity anymore. So I'm giving you that particular, so particle two initially at rest. This equation only works for that case. All right, so then V2 final, okay, will be then, two times M1 divided by M1 plus M2, and this whole quantity times V1 initial again, okay? That means you get two equations. This is how fast the object one is moving and in which direction after collision, and this is how fast the object two is moving and in which direction after the collision. Again, this is elastic collision, one dimension, right? And we can use this to find speed of the object one and two after the collisions. All right, so I think we're ready to go and start solving some problems. And let's do that for the, um, so let's, let's read the problem and figure out if it's elastic or inelastic. All right, so we have 1800 kilogram car stopped at the traffic light is struck from a rear by a 900 kilogram car. The two cars become entangled, moving along the same path as that of the originally moving car. 
if the smaller car were moving at 20 meter per second before the collision, what is the velocity of the entangled cars after the collision? Okay, so the question is, what type of problem is this? Elastic or inelastic collision? Well, think like this. So you have two objects. Here's object one. I'm going to just bring it as a particle. It doesn't matter, right? So here's object two. They're cars, but you can just bring it as a particle. So this is M1, let's say this is M2. What you have here is you have a V1 initial. So object one initially moving at 20 meter per second, okay? But object two, you can see, right? Uh, an 1800 car, which is object two, stopped at the traffic light. That means V2 initial here is zero. Then after the collision, it says then um, they get entangled. So, all right, so the cars become entangled which means they stick together. So this is, this is, let's say, before the collision. And what happens here, this is then after the collision. One and two, you know, stuck together and they're moving with some final velocity, okay? So that's before, well, let's say this is after. That means this is a perfectly inelastic collision. And I can say, all right, then that means M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial. This is momentum before equals to then M1 plus M2 times V final, which is their momentum after, okay? Remember, that's the equation for the perfectly inelastic, you know, conservation of momentum. And, and then we, we can make some of the things a little bit simpler because I know that V2 initial zero, that means it's just, this whole thing is zero, okay? That means what I have here is this. So I'm gonna also like switch the sides. I have then V final, times M1 plus M2 equals, over there I have just M1 V1 initial. Then I'm gonna divide both sides by M1 plus M2. And this should be for V final, all right? Let's just cancel out. So that means my V final equals M1 V1 initial over M1 plus M2. All right, so I'm given object one, remember object one is the one that is moving, which is 900 kilogram car. So it's 900 kilograms times how fast it was moving, which is 20 meter per second, divided by the total mass, which is 900 kilograms plus 1800 kilograms. I plug in, I will find 6.67 meters per second as the final speed of the particle. And since it's positive, it's gonna be moving in the same direction as the originally you know, the first, you know, original, you know, speed of the first car, okay? All right, so that means the two cars after the collision are gonna stick together and move to the right at the speed of 6.67 meter per second. All right. Here's another example. Okay, it says, in assembling a train from several railroad cars, two of the cars with masses of M1 equals two times 10 to the four kilograms and M2 equals four times 10 to the four kilograms are rolled toward each other. And you know, you can see that this one here is that, rolling toward each other. Uh, when they meet, they couple and stick together. Now the lighter car has an initial speed of 1.5 meter per second. So that means this is the information about how fast the car one was moving before the collision. Then the collision causes it to reverse direction at 0.25 meter per second. Now, there is no such thing as car one moving separately from car two after the collision because they stick together. That means this 0.25 meter per second in a reverse direction of car one, original direction, right? Means that you're given what's the speed and direction of the system after the collision because they stick together. We can say right, they combine M1 plus M2 together and they're moving with 0.25 meter per second in the opposite direction of the direction of the velocity of the object one. That means to the left, All right? That means we're given final velocity of the system, okay? The question is then, what was the initial speed of the heavier car? So we wanna find what is this guy over there? How fast it was, how, how fast car two was moving before the collision, All right? So that's what we're gonna find in this problem, All right? So let's do that for part A. All right, so again, it's a perfectly inelastic collision because they stick together, right? Then I can say, okay, so M1, V1 initial 
plus m2 v2 initial equals m1 plus m2 times v final. Nothing canceled out because, you know, there's a velocity for all of them. But remember, technically what I want to find here is this guy. So I keep it on the left side, m2 v2 initial equals, then I have m1 plus m2 times v final minus m1 v v1 initial, right? So I move this to the left, move this term to the left. Okay. And then from here, right, from this expression, I divide both sides by m2, which will give me v2 initial, right? That means V2 initial is equals to, so M1 plus M2, so which is, you can see, right? Two times 10 to the four, four times 10 to the four. So that's basically six times 10 to the four, right? So six times 10 to the four kilograms times V final, which is negative 0.25 meter per second minus uh, M1 times V1 initial. Well, M1 here is two times 10 to the four kilograms, and it was moving at 1.5 meter per second speed to the right. And this is divided by M2, which is four times 10 to the four kilograms. Okay. Well, if I calculate this, well, we're gonna get negative 1.1 meter per second, which should make sense because car, one, uh, car two was moving to the left, so it should have a negative velocity, okay. That was basically part A, initial speed of the heavier car. All right, so part B says, how much thermal energy is created in this collision? Well, thermal energy is created during the collision when one thing we're gonna see here is some of that kinetic energy of the system before collision will be converted to thermal energy. Uh, so thermal kinetic before collision will be converted into um, thermal energy during the collision. And when we calculate kinetic energy after the collision, since some of the initial kinetic energy has been converted to thermal energy, well, final kinetic energy should be less. And then we can find a difference to figure out how much of that energy was converted to thermal energy. Yeah. That means the idea is basically this. We find kinetic energy of the system before collision, okay? which will be, you know, one half mass times V1 initial square plus one half mass times V2 initial square. That means plugging their mass and their velocity values, right? Well, if I do that, right, it means you just plug in the mass and velocities for those, I should get 4.7 times 10 to the four joules, initial kinetic energy. Well, if I calculate final kinetic energy, which is of the system, right? Well, I have just to remember, now just a combined object, right? That means one half M1 plus M2 times V final square, right? Remember, V final here is 0.25 meter per second and total mass is M1 plus M2. If I plug in those values, I get, you know, 19, or you can say like, let's say 1.9 times 10 to the three joules. Okay, right, so technically then, things like this. So uh, what you have here is 4.7 times 10 to the four times now 1.9 times 10 to the four, or you can even say that this is 0.19 times 10 to the four joules. So it's easy, it will be easier for you guys to see, right? And then what we're gonna do here is, so let's say roughly 0.2 times 10 to the four joules. So this, you, have, you have this value over there, right? Before collision, kinetic energy. So this is kinetic energy before collision. This is kinetic energy after the collision. Look at by how much it was decreased. So then if I find then changing kinetic energy will be the difference between them, all right? So K final minus K initial. If I do that, what I will get here is negative 4.5 times 10 to the four joules. Now what I have here is then, then it's negative because it was decreased by that much. So then if I'm finding how much thermal energy was increased, well it was increased by exactly that much. Because all that energy that was lost as a kinetic energy now was gained as a thermal energy. Okay, 
So 4.5 times 10 to the 5, 10 tenths or 10 to the 4 joules, okay? Which is roughly 45,000 joules. All right. Here's one more example. And this is gonna be an example for elastic collision. So on an air hockey table, a moving pack traveling to the right at 2.3 meter per second makes a head-on collision with the identical pack, pack at rest. What is the final velocity of each pack? All right, so now one of the things we have here is this. We are given that they're identical, which means mass one equals mass two. And you can see, right, we're not even given their mass, but we're given that they're identical. And that's a you know, very important information. And what we're given here is this, before collision. Well, object two is at rest, object one moving to the right at 2.3 meter per second, okay? That means what I have here is, I have this, right? M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial equals M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. This guy here is zero, so this is zero. Now. What I have here is then it's it's one equation with two unknowns. I don't know V1 final, I don't know V2 final. So technically then I can use the kinetic energy equation, you know, do the substitutions and things like that. But remember, I gave you the equation for the, you know, inelastic, uh, sorry, elastic collision with object initially at rest. And that equation was, um, where you can say that V1 final equals M1 minus M2 divided by M1 plus M2 times V final. And then V2 final equals 2M1 over M1 plus M2, then times V final. So V1 final, oh, I'm sorry. This is V1 initial and this one also, V1 initial. That means those are the equations, you know, kind of like given to you for exactly this type of collision. Two objects colliding as a uh, elastic collision where object two initially at rest. Now, this equation, right, for basically any type of, you know, combination of mass, because here's one you can have. You can have different combination, right? So here's one of the combination, mass one equals mass two. You can also have a different one where mass, mass one greater than mass two or much greater than mass two. Okay, so much greater than mass two. Or we can have another one where mass two is much greater than mass one. Okay, so you can have like sort of three different conditions. Okay, and these conditions can be, you know, uh, applied to these equations, right? To solve for the V1 final, V2 final. Thing like this, right now we're given one of the conditions where we have two identical objects. Remember, we're not even given the mass, but remember if M1, equals m2 then you can say this is just equals to some m mass that means no need for subscript that means if you come back here you use basically saying m minus m over m plus m times v1 initial and at the top m minus m basically tells you that you're going to get zero which means after the collision mass one gonna stop even so don't don't get confused with that it's not going to have any speed, any velocity. It's going to stop, fully stop. Well, then how about mass two? Well, it's two times m over m plus m times v1 initial. Well, it's two m at the top. m plus m gives you another two m at the bottom times, uh, well, v1 initial was what? Uh, 2.3 meter per second. So this cancel each other. So you get 2.3 meter per second. That means after the collision, pack one gonna stop, pack two gonna basically move with the same speed as pack one before the collision, right? And that works only if the mass one and mass two are identical. That means they're the same. So all the energy goes from object one to object two. So that's why the energy is conserved. So since all the energy is you know, transferred from object one to object two, well, object two moving with the same speed as object one. All right, so one of the things I'm gonna do here, there's gonna be a simulation I'm gonna uh, post on Canvas where you will be able to play with some um, momentum, you know, problems. So there's gonna be like, let's say, a simulation where the object is gonna be, you know, uh, 
colliding with one another. So you can set their masses, set their velocities, put different conditions, elastic, inelastic, and things like that, and see how those things are related to it. It's gonna be very fun. So I recommend you guys play with that. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll have it on Canvas very soon. So you guys can, you know, try this different type of combination of uh, elastic, inelastic collision. All right. So here I have an example where there is a two-dimensional collision, okay? And two-dimensional collision, may, you know, takes into account that you have objects that are moving basically different, uh, let's say, axis, right? One is horizontal, the other one is vertical, thing like that, okay? So let's read the problem. So you have a 15 kilogram car traveling east with a speed of 25 meter per second, collides at an intersection with a 2,500 kilogram truck traveling north. So you can see, right, this guy going east, this one going north. Well, east is to the right, north is up. So that's right. So technically this I hat is same as, you know, X hat, and this J hat is same as Y hat. So there's another unit notation. So that means one is horizontal, the other one is vertical, okay? So generally this type of collision will look from the top. So that's right. So here's your coordinate system. Here's car one, you know, so you say on M1, V1 initial. Here's car two, M2, and it's moving up with V2 initial, okay? So you can see, right, um, you know, mass one is horizontal velocity, mass two is vertical. And we usually say that then they collide at the center of, you know, of this coordinate system at the origin, okay? And then the problem here is this. So basically, um, so the 1500 kilogram car traveling east with the speed of 25 meters per second collided at an intersection with the 2500 kilogram traveling north at the speed of 20 meters per second. Find the direction and magnitude of the velocity of the wreckage after the collision, assuming the vehicles stick together after the collision. Well, that means after the collision, they stick together and move as one with some kind of final velocity. And that's gonna be that final velocity. You can see, right, it's a two dimensional velocity. So that means you have, you have to consider in terms of, for this particular vector, right, final velocity. You wanna know, okay, so we can break it down into V final X and V final Y. And what, what I can do here is when I'm considering the horizontal momentum, I'm looking at, you know, horizontal velocities, including the final horizontal velocity, and then vertical velocities for the final vertical velocity, okay? So that's why we're gonna have two equations, uh, but we need to find V final X, V final Y, in order to find V final and this, you know, theta for the final velocity vector, okay? So, but in any case, so what I have here is, you know, we can see that we can have this again. So here's the coordinate system, right? So if I then take this problem into like, let's say here's the mass one. So V1 initial, and you can see, right, it's V1 initial X. And here's mass two. And this is basically V2 initial Y because one is only moving in a horizontal direction. Two is only moving in a vertical direction. Right? They're gonna collide here and move as one, right? That means, you know, what, one thing we need to do here is, you know, understand that when we get to this final velocity, we need to look at in terms of the components first, then find then the final velocity afterwards. All right, anyways, the idea here is you have two equations, one in the X direction, and this is conservation of momentum. That means you have M1, V1, initial in the X, plus M2, V2, initial in the X. I know there are a lot of subscripts, but you know, we have to write those. Then this is equals to, remember they stick together. So M1 plus M2, then times V final X, right? Because this is in terms of the X. That means we are looking at the final velocity, but in the X direction. Again, the subscript here is final X. And then we also have in the Y direction. So this is, will be then M1, V1 initial in the Y direction. And this is equal to an M1 plus M2, V final Y. All right. Now, I have a way of simplifying this because here's the thing. 
object two has no horizontal component. That means I can go to the equation, let's call this equation one, and let's call this equation two. I can go to equation one and cancel this thing because there's no V2 initial X. Object two has no initial horizontal velocity, it's moving in a vertical direction. Same way object one has no vertical velocity, it means I can go to equation two and cancel that. That's zero because there is no horizontal, uh, there's no vertical velocity for object two. I think you can see, right? There are ways to you know, simplify that. Now, what I'm gonna do here is, is slightly different from what I have in my lecture notes, the, you know, the, the PDF file. So in a way, I'm giving you two different ways of solving this. So you watch this one, go look at what I have in the notes, and you, know, you have now two different versions of that. Okay. So what I'm gonna do here is this. So basically, I have then this is equation one, which becomes M1, D1 initial uh, in X direction equals to, because since the other one is canceled, right? Equals to then M1 plus M2 times V final X. Okay. So what I'm gonna do here is since I'm given mass one, I'm given mass two, and since I'm given initial velocity of object one before the collision, so you can see, right? Technically I can use this equation to solve for V final X, right? So it's gonna be M1, V1 initial X, divided by M1 plus M2. So I can calculate that. You can say, right, okay, so mass one, which is 1500 kilogram times its velocity, and that was 25 meter per second. And this is divided by mass one plus mass two, which is 1500 plus 2500. So that's 4,000 kilogram combined mass. Well, if I calculate this, right, I should be able to get final velocity in the X direction, it means X component of that final velocity. Okay. So I get 9.38 meter per second. Okay. So this is the horizontal component. Then same way I can use equation two to find the vertical component because this becomes M2 V2 initial in the Y direction equals M1 plus M2 times V final in the Y direction. Again, rearranging to solve for V final Y, then this becomes M2 V2 initial in the Y direction divided by the combined mass. So then that's the second car, right? 2,500 kilogram that it was moving at uh, 20 meters per second, divided by the combined mass of 4,000 kilograms. Then I can find this. Which is 12.5 meter per second. That's then the Y component. Now remember, what I have here is the X component and Y component of the final velocity. And what I need is the magnitude and the direction of the final velocity. And hopefully at this point, you guys can do this, right? That means if you have the X component, you can use the Pythagorean theorem, right? FBX squared plus FBY squared to solve for the magnitude of the final velocity, okay? And if you calculate that, that means plugging the final X squared plus initial final y square, sorry, um, that means 9.38 square plus 12.5 square, we should get 15.6 meter per second. And that's final speed. And then I can use the inverse tangent. Oops. Of y over x, right? So 12.5 over 9.38 to calculate that is gonna be 53.1 degrees above the horizontal. Okay, that means find the magnitude and direction of um, final velocity of the collision. Okay. All right, so that's now, uh, that was a two dimensional problem. Again, go and watch the second um, version of solving this problem from my lecture notes. Okay. All right, so now one thing we have here is the impulse 
concept of impulse. Okay, so the impulse that means now we're kind of going uh, moving away from the conservation of momentum. So this is remember one thing we have is that for the conservation of momentum, for us to have the conservation of momentum, and this this is also known as the conservation of linear momentum because objects moving linearly, we need more than one object. Usually we, have, we consider two objects because we have a system of two particles. Because one of the things we have here is this. So think like this, here's object one moving with some initial velocity. And then there is a wall over there. So it's gonna collide with the wall. So this is, this is let's say before. And this is during. Well, what happens during the collision when it's collided with the wall, there's a force in this direction, right? So remember, we did this problem technically. So there's a force acting on it, some net force. Well, what will happen here, the object then after the collision, it's gonna bounce back with some final velocity, right? So it's gonna bounce back. Now, what happens here is, this is before, momentum before, let's call this initial, the mass times the initial. And this is after, right? Final momentum, mass times V final. And clearly you have a change in momentum. How do I know I have a change in momentum? Remember, momentum is a vector. No matter if the speed is the same before and after, you have a momentum that has a different direction, right? Because velocity is in different direction. Remember, direction can also change the vector change in direction changes vector. And here you have to the right compared to the left. That means you have a change in momentum. Well, remember what we have here, we talked about, right? Changing momentum over time is due to the, some kind of net force. I mean, there's a force acting on it during the collision, right? So this was during the collision, okay? Remember, there's no, we're not considering the now multiple objects. So this is just one object has a force acting on it. So this is technically an external force acting on it and it changes the momentum of the object. Okay, now what I can do here is this. I can rearrange and say, okay, so delta P on this left side, and I'm gonna take then delta T and move it to the left. That means multiply both sides by delta T. And what I get here is this. The left side becomes net force, external net force times delta T. Okay, that means what I have here is I'm saying that my momentum would change if there is a non-zero external net force acting on it during this time interval delta t, okay? That means you get, on the right side, you get two information, the force and the time interval, the product of those two. So then what we do here is we take this quantity, net force times delta t, this quantity, and we define this to be impulse, j as impulse. And it's a vector, it's same direction as the net force, right? So, but this is known as an impulse force, sometimes known as impulse force. Now that means this right side of this equation, right? Is now can be replaced with J, which is, you know, replaces net force times delta T because they're equivalent. That means what I can say here, then delta P is equals to this J. That means what I have here is I can say that impulse kind of combines two things together. When there's an impulse, that means there's a force, but there's also there's a force during that short period of time. That means we can say that the momentum of the object changes because of there was an impulse acting on the object. And again, impulse means that there was a force acting on the object during a short period of time, okay? So that's why then what I can say here is this. So this is modified equation for that, right? Where, you know, this, net force times delta T is replaced with the impulse. So then I have this. Impulse acting on the object will always change the object's momentum. And this is known as the impulse momentum theorem, okay? That means the impulse momentum theorem states that an impulse delivered to an object causes the object's momentum to change, okay? Again, impulse is information that tells you how much force and for how long it was acting on the object. So you can say, right, so technically one of the things we can have here is that impulse is a product between force and you know, time. So for example, if you increase the time of the collision, force then technically decreases. If you decrease the time of collision, 
forces then increases. Because one of the things you have here is, <clears throat> remember the impulse represents how much, let's say force and for how long the object experiences during a collision, okay? And it has a really good, you know, let's say real life application. Let me kind of give you an example. So let's say here's a car moving with some velocity, let's say, uh, I don't know, 15 meter per second. And there's a, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna slow down and stop. Okay, so let's gonna crash into something. So let's say it's a, you're driving on a freeway and let's say your brakes are not working. So you're gonna then let's say slow down and crash. And let's say there's a wall and there's nothing you can do. You can crash. So then uh, one thing you have, that means your mo momentum here is, you know, uh, let's say it's a, it's a thousand kilogram, right? Car is moving at 15 meter per second. That means your momentum here is mass times velocity. So 15 times 1,000, so 15,000, right? So 15,000 kilogram meter per second. That's your momentum initial. What's gonna be your final momentum? Well, you're gonna crash and stop, right? So, but you know, by, you know, when you crash, your car is probably gonna be damaged a lot, okay? So your final velocity is zero. So final momentum here is zero. That means you can see, right? What you have here is this, your change in momentum, which is final minus initial, is equal to negative 1,500 or 15,000 kilograms meter per second. Okay. Now, that means that's not gonna change because based on your you know, initial speed and your final speed, 15,000 kilogram meter per second. Okay. Now, what I want you also have here is that this impulse momentum theorem tells you that your J, which is the impulse delivered, right, from the wall, is also then equals to the change in momentum, which is equals to negative 15,000. Well, this is Newtons times second, right? Because see, Newtons times second. That means how many Newtons was acting on it and for how long, okay? Because technically this units of kilograms times meter per second is same as Newtons times seconds. Now the idea here is that you have this impulse, which is same as your change in momentum. But here's the thing, even though your impulse is gonna be same, which is negative 1500 Newton per second, that means you, you, you're stuck with this impulse. But remember your impulse is force times delta T, right? How much force car gonna experience and for how long? Now here's the thing, for example, if the time of collision is one second, then the, the force that you gonna have on the car from that wall, well, it will be 15,000 Newtons, right? Which is a lot, it's gonna you know, destroy your car. Okay. So that's gonna be a lot of force acting on your car. What, how about this? How about we can increase the time a little bit? For example, how about if I make this time of collision 10 seconds. Remember, the product of force and time, it still has to be 15,000, right? Because impulse on the left side here is 15,000. But see if I increase the time of collision, well, force then has to be only 1,500, right? Instead of 15,000. And that's a lot, that's a factor of 10 decrease in force. Well, what if I make this collision, I don't know, 20 seconds? Well, then this one even drops, becomes, you know, 750. Newton, you can see, right? And it's a huge, huge, huge difference. Okay, so then what are we doing over here? How can we then increase the time of collision? Well, here's what I can do. Imagine your car is moving and it's gonna hit the wall. But what I do in the wall, I put some barrels with water or you know something like that, right? So then when the car collides, it doesn't just hit the wall, it hits the barrels and then it barrels basically because they have water, it's gonna slow down the car until it hits the wall and, and basically it stops at with final velocity. Which means it increases the time of collision instead of like a one second when it hits the wall and just crashes, like 20 seconds because it hits the barrel and then you know slowly slows down until it stops. And instead of 15,000 Newtons, it's only gonna have 750 Newtons. Your car is gonna be damaged, but not as much. And you might be, you know, you might stay alive because of that. So that's why if you ever see the, those sharp corners in the freeway and things like that, you see those barrels of water, right? That's why they're, they're over there to minimize the 
force of impact by maximizing the time of collision. Because instead of hitting that sharp corner, right, the, you know, that concrete, right, you're gonna hit the barrel of the water and then slowly slow down and stop, okay? That's an interesting, you know, thing that, uh, let's say, real life application of this impulse force and how you can change the impulse. The same way, let's say, if you're, if you're, you know, a boxer, right, that's why you have those, you know, gloves, right? And if you hit somebody with your fist, right, then the time of collision of fist and face is very small. So then the force, you know, delivered to the face is large and your face can damage. But if you're wearing gloves, then the delivered force takes longer time because of that little cushion, right, in the, in the gloves, which then minimizes the, you know, force. So then boxers using gloves not to damage each other too much. Anyways. So you can see, right, the impulse can be written in terms of X and in terms of Y, because for example, if this is a horizontal change in momentum, which is P final X minus P initial X, well, this is equal to the horizontal impulse because horizontal impulse gives you horizontal change in momentum. And if it's a vertical, then this becomes change in vertical momentum, which is P final Y minus P initial Y. Okay, so that's why it's, it's, it's more or less two dimensional, right? You have to kind of take that into account, okay? Again, so I have that written here as well. So let's kind of summarize that. So you can see, right? Horizontal momentum or horizontal impulse changes your horizontal momentum. Vertical impulse changes your vertical. Remember the impulse tells you in which direction force, were, force was acting and for let's say how long. All right, so here's then one, uh, one uh, a few examples, right? So let's say you have an object sitting at rest, okay? Where is the momentum? Zero. Well, how to change momentum? Well, deliver an impulse force. That means you apply force during that short period of time. And you can see from here, right? See, the collision is not instantaneous because any object, even like a golf ball or, or anything like that, right? So like this is a golf ball over here, they're a little bit elastic. So when you hit, there is a little bit of period where the ball is compressed and there it's expanded, okay? That means what I have here is during the time when it's compressed and expanded, that's my delta T. And then this is the force. And then the force and delta T combined give me the impulse, all right? And see in which direction is the impulse. That's the direction technically is for the, or, or the, the, the impulse is in the direction of the change in momentum, so let's say. That's kind of like the idea. All right, so, uh, and here's the two dimensional, right? So let's say here's the object moving with some initial momentum, then you apply impulse force, again, because of the elasticity of the ball, okay? And then you can see right now the object moving over here. See, initial momentum, final momentum, and this is the change in momentum, right? The difference, that's the direction of the impulse. All right, so let's uh, look at this example for the, you know, uh, impulse momentum theorem. So you have a 150 gram baseball is thrown with a speed of 20 meter per second. It is hit straight back toward the pitcher at the speed of 40 meter per second. The impulse force of the, of the bat on the ball has the shape shown in, oops, in the diagram right here, let's say. All right, so now what is the maximum force, F max, you wanna find it F max, uh, that the bat exerts on the ball? And what is the average force that the bat exerts on the ball? All right, so we wanna find, as you can see, right, this graph represents force as a function of time. That means this is before collision and then this is the start of the collision. And what I have here is that force because the elasticity of the baseball, right? So this is the pre period when the ball is compressing, that means force is increasing, and this is when it's expanding, the so force is decreasing. That means this is the collision time, which happened to be in 0.6 milliseconds. And the force is not constant, it's variable. It increases and decreases, and then you have the maximum force. Well, one of the things we can do here is this. For example, now, this is my start, this is my final you know, time of the collision. And that's the graph, okay? So then one of the things I can do here, for example, I have a maximum force over there, 
but I can also present this with some kind of, you know, maybe average force. So let's say F average. And they are related. So for example, then this F average, always gonna be half of the F maximum, okay? And this equation where delta P is equals to, uh, let's say, net force times delta T. So technically this is average force over there. That means I can find the average force from here, right? Or, you know, remember, so that, so this is, you know, same as J, right, impulse. So I can find impulse and then use that to find average force. And then from that, then I can, you know, uh, find, let's say, that particular average, you know, force. There, there, there are a number of things I can do, okay? So also one of the things I can do here is I can find, you know, let's say the area under this, right? Because one of the things I have here is impulse is the area under the graph, okay? So impulse is area under the graph and it's a triangle, it's one half base times height. I can use that to find F maximum directly and then, you know, taking half of that to be, you know, average force. There are, like, there are a number of ways we can go around. But, you know, let's, let's do this. So I can say then, you know, it's a, you can see, right? Here's the picture of my before collision. So we have an object moving to the left at 20 meter per second. It has a mass of 150 grams, so 0.15 kilogram. And then it's gonna be, you know, you're gonna strike it with the ball, uh, the, ba uh, the bat, right? And then the ball is now moving to the right at 40 meter per second, okay? That means there's a, you know, change in momentum. You can strike both in speed and direction. So then here's what I can do. I can calculate my uh, change in momentum. Oops. So then this will be final momentum. It's all in the horizontal direction. So P final X minus P initial X. All right, so P final, it's in terms of mass times V final X, and then P initial is mass times V initial X, okay? So then I can kind of, you know, you can see I can factor out mass, and this becomes just V final minus V initial. Let's say X, X. All right, so let's calculate what's my change in momentum. All right, so the mass is 0.15 kilograms. And this is times V final X, which is 40 meter per second minus V initial X. And that's negative, right? Negative 20 meter per second because it was moving to the left initially. All right, so if I calculate that, I'm going to get 9.0 kilograms meter per second. So 9.0 kilogram meter per second. That means my, that's my delta P. Okay. Well, this is my delta P. That means this is also my impulse, J. Remember, right? So that's my impulse. And now what is the impulse equals to? Well, it's an area under the graph. It means one half base times height. Well, that means one half F max times delta T. Or, or basically F average times delta T, right? So kind of, you can do that. But since we're given sort of like the graph, right? So that means here you can calculate both of those things. So you can say, okay, F average is equals to then J divided by delta T or F max is equals to, you know, two times J divided by delta T. You can kind of do that. So this is then 9.0 kilograms meter per second divided by 0.6 then times 10 to the negative three seconds because it's 0.6 millisecond or then two times 9.0 times 9.0 kilograms meter per second divided by 0.6 times 10 to the negative three seconds. You can use this to calculate, you know, both of those. So here you're gonna get 15,000 newtons. Here you're gonna calculate uh, 30,000 newtons. I'm missing one zero over there. So 15,000 newtons and 30,000 newtons. All right, that's our, that's our answer. All right, so hopefully you were able to follow. Remember, you can always go back and rewatch this to, you know, get a little better insight. Okay, so the last topic of this chapter is center of mass, which is kind of like going to give us some, you know, um, 
useful ideas for the next chapter, chapter nine, which is now we're gonna look at the rotational system. Because here we can already think of, like, think of it like this. So we've been already working with not just single object, but multiple objects. That means I can have a system that, you know, can be moving as a, you know, system of multiple particles, like over there you can see right in the diagram. And then one of the things I can see here is, you can see, right? So the system rotates clockwise when the force is applied. So let's say there's a force applied, right? It makes the system kind of rotate clockwise, okay? Well, that means one of the things I have here is if I apply force, uh, because you have, you have two objects, right? You have mass one, let's say mass two, connected by a string. So if I pull at that, at this point, right? The system actually, you know, gonna make it rotate. Or if I pull over here, it's also gonna make it rotate, but in opposite direction. But what I want here, I wanna pull somewhere that it's, you know, the whole system without rotating is moving. Well, I can do that if I apply force at the, this very special point, we call it center of mass. It means if I pull it there, the entire system moves as one without you know, any rotation, okay? So then you can see, right, there's this special point in the system or object called the center of mass that moves as if all the mass of the system is concentrated at a point, okay? So that's also can be, the, you know, you can think of like, let's say if you take a, take, if you have a ruler, you can do that. So take, take a ruler. And one thing I have here is that this is like, let's say now it's called an extended object because you have an object that has a combination of mass. So that means, for example, what I have here is this. So remember, uh, one thing I have here is there is a gravity acting on the, on the object, right? So technically I can think of like, let's say, instead of this you know, ruler as just one particle, right? Well, it's a more you know, extended object. That means there's probably gravity acting on every single particle in, the, in this meter stick. And again, that's, you know, that's a gravitational force acting on every single particle. And it's a very simplified because there are billions of particles. Okay. So imagine, let's say if I wanna then balance this. Well, if I wanna balance it means I have to technically apply force on every single one of those particles that have a gravitational force, which is not very easy to do. But instead of that, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say, you know what? It's, a, it's, a, it's not a collection of many, many particles, but it's an object where I can find this, this is one point where I can say that all of the mass of the object is then is concentrated at that point. And then I can say that since then this object has all the mass concentrated at one point, let's say somewhere over here, then gravity is only acting at that point because you know all the mass is right there and the gravity acting on the mass. That means all I have to do here is then apply force in the opposite directions of kind of normal force, right, to balance it. And you can take a ruler and find one point where you apply force upward, right? Put your finger up, apply force upward where the you know, meter stick or ruler is balanced. And that point is known as a center of mass. And if it's a meter stick, it will be exactly at halfway, which is 15 centimeters. If it's a ruler, it will be exactly, ex again, at the halfway. So if you find the halfway position, put your finger up there, you know, under that, you will see that you can balance the system without making it rotate. Okay, so that's kind of what we're gonna be able to do. That means we can kind of think of like, let's say if you have a system, or for example, here you have two objects, right? M1 and M2, okay? And you wanna find the center of mass of this system of two particles, okay? And you can say then to find that, we can kind of, you know, put it in a coordinate system. So let's say since both of them are in a horizontal axis, so let's say you draw a horizontal axis like this, right? So you have the horizontal axis. Then you have M1 and M2 on some horizontal positions. Okay, so let's say this is the origin. Let's see, this is the position of X1. That means how far away mass one, center of mass one from X1. Here is then position of object two from the, you know, origin, which then this will be the position of, you can say, right, X2, object two from the origin, okay. Then somewhere between them is then the center of mass relative to the origin, okay. And I can calculate the center of mass by taking the object one mass and multiplying by its position. Then adding this to the object two mass and times its position, and then dividing by the total mass of the system, and one plus M2. And I can find this position X, center of mass. So you can see, right? 
then this equation is if you have multiple objects in the system and you want to find central mass you use the product of mass and position right m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus m3 x3 plus plus whatever how many you have right and then divide this by total mass so that's why it's it's a it's a sum of the product mass and position of how many objects you have and divided by total mass of the system and same thing you can do for the y center of mass which will be m1 y1 plus m2 y2 plus dot 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 mn yn divided by total mass over here like input put like m where m is the sum of all the uh, well, let me just like this so it's going to be then let, let's say m1 plus m2 plus dot 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 mn okay so you have then these two equations for the x coordinate system this is for the y coordinate system all right let, let's do an example here okay so a system consists of three particles located as shown find the center of mass of the system the masses of the particles are so m1 is one kilogram m2 is also one kilogram and m3 here is then two kilograms and you also give them position right so let's say this is x1 from here to there this is x2 and you can see right so technically then you know position of uh let's say here's here's particle one here's m1 so m1 is one kilogram and position of m1 here is this you know so remember i'm writing this in terms of x1 y1 right so this will be then um one meters and zero meters for the y because it's on the horizontal axis and here's my object two which is also one kilogram and its position here is again i'm writing as x2 y2 so then this will be two meters in the x direction and zero for the y direction and here's object three which is then two kilograms and then this will be x3 y3 so it's in terms of its coordinate and then this will be zero for x and two meters for y all right so as you can see now i need to then find the central mass of the system but this is two-dimensional right so that means i need to have two equations x center of mass and y center of mass so let's start with x center of mass well this is then m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus m3 x3 and then divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3 from here we can see right then x3 is zero right so this guy here is zero and then what i have here is then m1 here is one kilogram times x1 which is one meter plus x2 which is again one kilogram times its position will two meters and this is divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3 right that's a total of four kilograms that means x center of mass is equals to so here one times one so it gives me one kilograms meters plus mass two times x2 so that gives me two kilograms meters this is then divided by four kilograms so what i get here is i get three kilograms meters over four kilograms so the kilograms cancel out and I get three fourths meters. Okay, which is basically X center of mass then 0.75 meters. Same thing I do for Y center of mass will be M1 Y1 plus M2 Y2 plus M3 Y3 divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3 but because y1 and y2 are zero this is zero this is zero all i end up here is then two kilograms times two meters divided by four kilograms right for the total mass and that gives me four over four so one meters that means i have x center of mass is 0.75 meters y center of mass is one meters okay that means you can say that r center of mass is equals to then uh, so it's equals to then in terms of the you know x position of 
0.75 and y position of, sorry, you wanna write down the units and one meter. So that's, as you can see right here, is 0.75 and one. And that's the center of mass of this system. All right, guys, so this concludes chapter, um, chapter eight. So uh, again, so make sure you guys watch it. You can even watch it multiple times. It always helps. Look at the lecture notes and, you know, make sure you guys work on the homework problems.